Fluent Python is an awesome Python book that's really going to level up your Python game. But it is a long book, it's close to a thousand pages, and we're all busy. So I'm going to help you out, I'm going to tell you which sections are most useful to you, depending on where you're at with Python and where you're at with programming in general. And I'll finish with my opinions and thoughts on the book. So one group of people that's going to get a lot of value out of Fluent Python are people who are sort of intermediate in Python already, or people who are quite experienced in another language and are just now coming to Python. And people in that group are going to definitely want to read part one, and he calls this part of the book data structures, but to me this part of the book is really just Python basics. It's stuff everybody who's going to use Python in a serious way should know. For example, chapter three, dictionaries and sets, quite powerful, quite useful in Python, quite easy to use, but they have capabilities you may not know about. For example, I thought I knew dictionaries as well as you could know them, but I didn't know that chain map was a thing. Now I know. I didn't know too much about frozen sets. Now I know why you might use a frozen set over a normal set. So that was pretty useful. Or chapter five, data class builders. Data classes are quite useful, quite essential, quite convenient, but they're weirdly like not covered that well in a lot of Python learning material. I say this as someone who teaches Python, who's looked at a lot of different Python courses. A lot of them just sort of skip data classes, which is weird, and they shouldn't do that. This book does not do that. It'll get you covered for data classes and how they work in detail. Or chapter six, this talks about references, mutability, and recycling. These are essentials that you have to know if you're gonna use Python well. So as I said to me, all of the people who are intermediate or who are coming to Python from another language, 100% you're gonna to wanna to read part one. But there's a few other chapters I would also recommend to people in that group. So I would say chapter 11. This really talks, it's called a Pythonic object, and it's about how you might make an object or a class that behaves in a very Pythonic way. And it's just an introduction. The rest of this part three covers that in more detail. And I don't necessarily think everybody's gonna need all of part three, but I do think everyone should read chapter 11, because it's gonna kind of clarify what Pythonic is and why we want objects to behave in this way and give a simple example of that. And furthermore, I think everyone who's intermediate in Python or coming to Python from another language should read chapter 17 as well. This is iterators, generators, and classic coroutines. Hugely important, very useful. If you don't know how generators work in detail, that's a tool that you're not using, and you should learn about that tool because it's quite powerful. Chapter 18 as well, quite useful for everybody, covers context managers and match statements in detail. Context managers, super useful, fairly simple. I had used them before, but I didn't really know the nuts and bolts of how they worked. And I think they're so useful that it's worth learning how they work in detail. So chapter 18 is going to do that for you. Now, for most people who are coming to Python from another language or who are kind of intermediate in Python, I'd also recommend part two, which is really about functions in Python and how to use them most effectively. Now, some people can probably skip part two. If you're already very comfortable with functional programming or specifically functional programming in Python, you already know what decorators and closures are and how they work. You're already quite comfortable with functions as first class objects. Maybe you can skip this section, but if you're coming from a language where functional programming doesn't work as smoothly as it does in Python, you may want to read part two. So part three is getting kind of deeper into the material, getting into a lot more technical nuance, and not everybody's going to need to read part three. Part three is really most focused on typing in Python and also on building Pythonic objects. Do you want to build a class that behaves in a very smooth, easy, effortless way that's congruent with how the rest of Python works? If yes, read part three. And so one chapter I found tremendously interesting in part three is chapter 13, one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. It's called Interfaces, Protocols, and ABCs, but what it's really about is a much deeper dive into how typing works and how typing might work and how you can kind of customize the way typing works for what you need in Python. And I've never loved Python's type hinting. Um, I find it useful when I'm reading other people's code, but kind of annoying to type in myself. I think a lot of people feel the same way. But what this chapter does, what this chapter showed me, is that there is so much more power and versatility in how you might do typing in Python. Did you know about goose typing? 
I didn't know about goose typing. That's really weird and different. And here's a chart they use in the book that just really, I was like, ooh, nice chart. So have a look at that. And if you're intrigued by this, you'll definitely want to read chapter 13. Now, some of these other chapters in part three, eh, you, you can kind of make your own choice if you're going to read them or not. Chapter 14 is basically about how inheritance is, is bad and some useful ways, some good ways to use inheritance, but also a lot of bad ways. And so if you're more than familiar with these warnings about, you know, favor composition over inheritance, inheritance makes your code overly coupled and brittle and so on, you, you could probably skip chapter 14. I do, as an educator, feel that inheritance is kind of taught in a bad way. It's introduced too early to students when they don't really understand why it's needed or the potential drawbacks. And so students and, you know, working programmers after they get out of school tend to overuse inheritance and build overly complicated hierarchies. But chapter 14 is sort of a warning to people who are building these overly complex hierarchies why you might not want to do that. Now, chapter 15 is really a lot more technical detail about type hints. I I didn't love the chapter. I thought it was a bit confusing. What is variance and covariance for typing? Uh, It tells you that in here. And you'll want to read that if you really want to make type hinting work for what you're building in the best possible way. But I don't know. I don't know that everybody needs to read chapter 15. And chapter 16, operator overloading. You could skim this if you're going to overload operators. There is useful information here, but I myself felt like I knew a lot of what's in chapter 16 already before reading the book. So in general, part three, read this if you're building your own Python classes, larger classes that you want to give to other people and have them work in a Pythonic way. But I don't know that everybody needs to read this. I would recommend chapter 13 particularly highly, though. Very intriguing chapter that I liked reading a lot. Now, another part of the book that's going to be useful to a lot of people, but not necessarily everyone, are the three chapters on concurrency. And so this is chapters 19, 20, and 21 in the second edition book. They're called uh, Concurrency Models in Python, Concurrent Executors, and Asynchronous Programming. Those are going to be tremendously useful if you need to write code like that. And what I really appreciate about these three chapters is that I've read a decent number of different coding books, and in some other books, they try and cram a chapter about concurrency into like 20 pages, and that's just ridiculous. No one's actually going to be able to use concurrency in a competent fashion after 20 pages, and so these other authors in other books, they they give a very superficial view of concurrency. Oh, here's what a thread is. Here's a couple tricks. Good luck. You know, you'll need that good luck because you're probably going to mess something up if you only read 20 pages about concurrency. That's just not enough. So this book doesn't do that. This book goes from page 699 to about 830, just about concurrency. So that's well over 100 pages, much more thorough, and I really appreciated that more in-depth approach. Having said that, not everyone does need to write asynchronous code. So if you don't, okay, obviously go ahead and skip this section. Now, part five is where we really go deep into the dark, mysterious areas of Python. It's about metaprogramming, but it's not for everybody. He does tell you multiple times that this is not things most people need to be messing around with. That uh, meta classes, for example, I believe the quote is, meta classes are deeper magic than 99% of people should ever worry about. And he says they're dangerous, they're easy to design poorly, they're easy to get wrong, they're probably unnecessary, etc. If you're like me, all of these warnings just make you really want to read that section. So I did. And if you want to peer deep into the guts of Python, or you're building your own larger system, you'll want to read Part 5, Metaprogramming. But not for everyone. Plenty of people can still use Python at a professional level without ever bothering with meta classes. But I really like chapter 23 about descriptors. This made me understand descriptors in a much more basic fundamental way. I had a basic understanding before, but now I feel like I understand the nuts and bolts. And it made this accessible. I feel like I understand them fairly well now. And chapter 24, of course, metaprogramming. Yes, it's confusing. Yes, it's advanced. But if you're going and reading this chapter, you're probably the type of person who either really needs it or you like learning dark, mysterious, complex things that the author warns you are probably useless. Hey, I'm in that group. If you're in that group, too, that's cool. If you're intrigued by this idea of like what's really going on in the guts of Python and how truly customizable you can make objects and classes at a fundamental, deep, dark level, 
oh yeah, read chapter 24, read all of part 5. So that's who should read which sections of Fluent Python, and I'd like to finish with some things that I generally liked and appreciated about the book. So I really like the way the code examples in this book are written. I feel like the author went out of his way to write code samples that are simple, but still illustrate the concept. And that's hard to do. A lot of coding books, they give big examples that are too long that most people skip. I read 90% of the coding examples in here. I'm not going to say I read every single one, but most of them, and they're great. And another thing I really like about this book is he kind of pulls from his own wisdom as a Python creator and from the wisdom of the larger Python community and shares that wisdom about Python with you through his opinions, which go at the end of each chapter in nice, tidy sections, but also through quotes from other people who are influential in the Python community. And I found these tremendously interesting and often valuable. Let me share a couple of those quotes with you. So on page 365, we have this great quote about what it is to be Pythonic. Now, Pythonic is hard to define, but this gets pretty close to capturing it. So this quote is from Martin Fashin, creator of Python and JavaScript frameworks, and he says this is what it is to be Pythonic. For a library or framework to be Pythonic is to make it as easy and natural as possible for a Python programmer to pick up how to perform a task. And another piece of coding wisdom from the author himself that I really appreciated is on page 519. And he's basically telling you that you should not be defining multi-level class hierarchies if you're writing normal app code. And so he says that if you are writing an app and you're defining complex hierarchies, you're going wrong, most likely, and you're probably making one of these mistakes. You are reinventing the wheel. You are using a badly designed framework. You are over-engineering, or you're just bored and you're building your own framework. So I, I, you can read more about it in the book, but I found this very interesting, and it definitely neatly summarizes where I think some frameworks and some programmers go wrong with overdoing their object-oriented hierarchies. So pick up this book if you're a Python programmer and you want to get more value out of Python and learn how your tools work in a much more nuanced and technical way. Here's a quick summary of the different groups of people who I think would benefit from this book and which sections they should read. I will say it's not for Python beginners. I probably should have put that at the start of the video. If you just wrote your first for loop yesterday, no, this is not the book for you. You're going to get lost very quickly. But for everybody else who's on this side panel, pick up the book. It's a great book. This is not an ad. I don't have any affiliate links. I just read the book and wanted to share with people. Have a wonderful day.